Hey, folks, welcome back to the Lincoln Project Podcast. It's 42 days until the election. Do me a favor, go out and once again, check your voter registration at vote.org. There is a lot of shenanigans happening out in the states. You need to check your voter registration. If you are good to go on your voter registration, let me encourage you, get out there now and vote. Go vote early, vote absentee, vote mail ballot, get that vote in as soon as possible. We want election night to be a really bad one for Trump. And if we flood the zone on the front end by voting early, it is going to make it harder for them to play their games and try to pretend this election wasn't real or that it was stolen or any other other package of lies. With that, we've got a great guest today. Ryan Hampton has written a book called Fentanyl Nation. It is a really deep dive into a crisis that is rocking America at every level of society, and he is a really committed guy in this cause. He's also a great candidate in the state of Nevada, running for state assembly, and I recommend you give it a look, have give it a listen, and let's get going. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. There is not a liberal America, any conservative America. There is the United States of America. And good luck. Hey, folks, welcome back to the Lincoln Project. I'm Rick Wilson. My guest today is Ryan Hampton. Ryan is the author of a tremendous but dark new book called Fentanyl Nation. It is about one of the most dangerous waves of narcotics to sweep this country in our lifetimes. Ryan has looked at where it came from, what works in fighting back against the fentanyl epidemic, which is a real and consequential thing. And he's also right now running for state house in, in the great state of Nevada. And, um, and, and so he is experiencing not only the, 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 the crisis that we're having <laughs> dealing with fentanyl, but also the crisis we're having in our politics. Um, and in a lot of ways, they kind of run together. So with that, Ryan, I want to welcome you to the, uh, to the Lincoln Project podcast. Thank you so much for coming on. Tell us where the fentanyl crisis came from and where it stands today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, thanks for having me, Rick. I mean, first and foremost, I am a candidate. I am running. I'm an author. Uh, my daytime job, I actually do this work every single day. I, I celebrate 10 years uh, in recovery on February 2nd, 2025. Uh, and uh, a lot of this work and a lot of my passion uh, for this work comes from my own lived experience, but also losing a lot of people close to me. I, I lost another friend on Monday um, hmm. to a preventable overdose. And, and, you know, there's been some news recently, um, just yesterday, actually, that we're seeing numbers on the decline, uh, almost 10 percent. Um, but we're still far away from where we should be. You know, since 1999, uh, more than a million people uh, have died of an overdose. The United States, by far, uh, has the highest drug overdose uh, rate in the world. Um, right. By 2022, we were losing an average of 300 Americans a day. To overdose, uh, drug deaths have only declined twice uh, mm -hmm. in the past 30 years. Uh, just setting the table for you and, and your listeners, only 20, about 20 percent um, of those folks got medication uh, for their opioid use disorder in 2021, which was a year into the pandemic uh, when overdoses were skyrocketing. You know, in 2020, we allocated about 4.07 billion for border patrol, but 2 million people were still arrested crossing the southern border and the number of illegal crossings, which we don't talk about as much uh, in Canada, actually tripled. Uh, right. And more than 1 million people are arrested for drugs each year, for, and many of them for simple drug possession. Um, 50, we can't forget also 50 million adults, about 20% of all Americans suffer with chronic pain. So the media sure. narrative and hype that we hear around fentanyl does disproportionately impact this community. About five to eight million of these pain patients regularly rely on opioids, many of them fentanyl, which has been a staple of Western medicine for a long time mm -hmm. uh, to treat their condition. And suicides are disproportionately um, hitting this population because they can't get access to the actual medication. But you know, to your question on, you know, where it comes from and, and this toxic politics we live in today, you know, fentanyl it, and particularly fentanyl overdose, it's this nuanced issue, right? It destroys mm -hmm. divisions, I believe, between red and blue. I don't think there is, and I think most people should agree, even though we're headed into this or in the middle of this toxic political season, um, that there shouldn't be a party line 
when it comes to this issue, when it comes to fentanyl. You know, if you look at a map, every state, city, rural, urban, suburban, it's impacted by fentanyl use, addiction, and overdose. And never in American history has a drug crisis reached this level. We're, we're kind of living through this public health disaster. But, right. you know, there's been a lot of ink, right? A lot of ink that's been spilled um, on who's to blame for this. And what I argue, what I argue in my campaign, what I argue in this book, Fentanyl Nation, is that every system is partially responsible. It's been a massive policy failure and regulatory failure between healthcare, uh, drug enforcement agencies, our justice systems, drug policy, the whole medical system. Um, you know, a classic example of this, of, of why we're in, where, why where we're at today with overdose deaths is really how the Drug Enforcement Administration, right, has uh, dropped the ball and also how they meddle, have been meddling with our, our, our medical care. Um, you could take the best, most effective treatments for opioid use disorder like methadone and like buprenorphine, sure. which is oftentimes called Suboxone. You know, these medications are the only treatments for opioid addiction that reduces the risk of fatal overdose by nearly 50 percent or more. But for many years, you know, federal rules, especially from the DEA, have kept these essential medicines stigmatized. It's kept them inaccessible. It's kept them, you know, overregulated. Right. Um, and tens of thousands of people have died. So let me dig into that for a second. The the DEA putting methadone, suboxone, these other drugs into a category that is near to heroin or opioids or, or what have you um, has made it less less viable, less accessible, less less uh, giving people less of an ability to access the thing that works for treatment. Um, the other right. story that I that I really didn't follow, didn't understand until I was looking through the book, is the the Narcan is now widely available during the, because of the Biden administration. They've made it widely available. That's I from what I've read in part why we're seeing about a ten percent drop in these fatalities because people now can access Narcan inexpensively, widely. You know, it's it's you can get it in a drugstore. You can get it anywhere now, um, and that is something that has helped prevent some of these overdoses because the problem with fentanyl seems to be that there's no determination on on the the you know it's it's in the recreational drug pool you have no clue how much is going to be there and it, and and a very little does almost fatal damage if you're not super careful no absolutely so it, thank you for bringing up naloxone one of the things that i actually am calling for in the book i've laid out uh, a, a list of poli what I believe should be bipartisan, unifying, you know, things that, that policymakers could do to help curb these overdose deaths. And at the top of that list is expansion of Narcan and Naloxone. This is the um, overdose reversing medication. Um, it actually really funny, uh, not even funny, um, sad. Um, it was actually a stigmatized medication for quite some time. Right. Um, folks saw it as a crutch. They thought that if you know, people suffering from substance use disorder and opioid use disorder had access to it. They thought that maybe it was, you know, another reason for them to use that. There is no science rooted in that. That is all fear mongering. There is no there right. is no facts uh, associated with that. And it did go over the counter um, about a little bit over a year ago. But folks need to realize that didn't just happen overnight. The FDA didn't just show up and say, hey, we want to make Narcan over the counter. Myself and many advocates on the ground who there has been a lot of blood that has been shed to get the FDA to do that. We started calling right. for that in 2018. And in 2019, the FDA scientific advisory panel made that recommendation. And it took until 2023 and 2024 to actually deploy it and get into pharmacies. Now we have a larger hurdle, though, and I, I address this in the book, and that's that some pharmacies aren't carrying it, A, and right. B, the price is too high. The price is astronomical. It is um, costing folks uh, on average about 45 to $49 for a dose of Narcan when it is a medication that costs a nickel to produce. And I can tell you for any 
you know, person who's suffering right now, and particularly given the dynamics of the economy right now, that is a lot of money. I can tell you when I, you know, when I, when, when I was uh, suffering from, from opioid use disorder, um, there were many times, sometimes I was on the street, right? I didn't have a roof over my head. I didn't have right. 10 cents to my name, let alone 45 to $49 to go in and get Narcan. And I argue in the book that, look, there have been two declared public, major declared public health crises um, here in the United States as of recently, right? One being the COVID right. pandemic sure. and one being the overdose crisis. With the COVID pandemic, though, I think we really did a good job, right? Like we marshaled every resource that we have available yep. to us to help mitigate the disease spread and save lives. With the overdose crisis, not so much, right? We were able to give away a free vaccine and we are able to mail people testing kits still for free to test for COVID, right, from time to time. Um, but with Narcan, I argue it is such a cheap and ex inexpensive medication that there is a generic available that we should be making it widely available for free right now. And it should be stocked right. everywhere. Yeah, I mean, I, we were at a we were at a, a conference last weekend at the Texas Trip Fest, and in the swag bags were Narcan. Mm -hmm. And I'm yeah. thinking, yeah, this is a fascinating moment that there, there's a recognition that this is a thing, that this is something that can mm -hmm. can stop this. So the argument has always been that you that, that dealing with the supply side of of any drug epidemic, whether it's whether it's drugs that have been translated from the legal market into the into the illegal market or whether it's you know south american drug production dealing with the supply side has historically never worked you mm. you cannot you you cannot nuke enough people uh, unless you're willing to nuke people um, to like make cocaine production in the upper hulaga valley stop you're not going to stop the sort of things that are that the production of these drugs because there is always a market. There is always a demand for it. You talk a lot about how to deal with the demand side of this. Um, wor work us through that. Talk to us about why the demand side is the solution to a lot of these problems. Uh, absolutely. Thank you for the question. You know, I think for any student of politics or economics, too, right, that you could say that supply, it's a balance between supply and demand, right? Sure. And I think that the Always. United States and certainly a lot of a lot of states, right? Because we have to remember that a lot of this policy too comes down to the states. It comes down to state legislatures, um, which is one of the reasons I decided to run for the state legislature. But right. there has to be a balance between supply and demand. Yes, we absolutely need to reduce supply, right? Sure. But without reducing demand at, at parity level, right? And, and equal um, on the supply, the problem continues to get worse because folks will always search out something different. And today, in today's illicit drug market, right, we live in the time of synthetics. We're now in the third wave of the overdose crisis. The first wave, which is what I got caught up in, you know, in the early 2000s, was, you know, gaslit by, you know, bad actors such as Purdue Pharma and McKesson and the Sacklers sure. and, you know, through the prescription opioid crisis. And then we moved into the second wave, right, which was heroin. Now, the second wave kicked off because we dealt with the first wave by just reducing supply. So that's how I ended up using heroin was I showed up at a doctor's office one day because I was prescribed opioids right. um, and Oxycontin um, through um, through what was, you know, unbeknownst to me at the time, a pill mill. Um, and when I was abruptly cut off because the state of Florida, which is where I uh, was born and raised, mm -hmm. decided in 2000, I'm sorry, 2008, they were just going to cut off the supply. They were going to cut off the people who were misusing the drugs. They were going to institute a drug monitoring database and they thought the problem would go away. No, more folks moved to heroin and more, and right. then more, and it became more toxic. Now we're in this new phase of synthetics, which actually makes the, the supply side much harder, right? Because we're no longer dealing with heroin. We're no longer dealing with this large, you know, agricultural crop, right? That, that, that takes time for harvesting and water and right. literally armies, uh, you know, you know, down in Mexico that are protecting it. Synthetics, the chemicals for the synthetics can be bought online, literally yep. shipped to you from China, and then they can be manufactured in someone's bathtub. And that's why we call fentanyl the bathtub gin of opioids. So 
we can continue going down this road of this disproportional response. And I, given we're in the new era of synthetics, unless we deal with demand, it's not fentanyl today, but it will definitely, without a question, be something else tomorrow. Now, how do we deal with demand, you ask? So, Look, I think, you know, if, when, when, when the history books are written about this, which they, they will be, um, and sure. we look at how we got to this 10% decline just in the last year, it, Dr. Nora Volkow, uh, uh, someone who I greatly admire and anybody should admire, she served under multiple presidential administrations, no matter what party they are, um, says it really comes down to the expansion of MOUD, which is medication for opioid use disorder, yep. buprenorphine and methadone, and the wide axis of naloxone. But I will also add in there, I believe it, you know, there's a third part to that, which is reducing harm for people, right? Because it you, you have to keep people alive. Like not every single person is going to be ready to go to treatment the second they need sure. it. The average, the average time science and data will tell us is, It takes about seven and a half times, sadly, for someone to be able to actually stick to treatment and enter into long-term recovery and long-term wellness. So that means for those folks that are in those gaps, in those cracks, we have to keep them alive. Every life is worth saving. So that means Mm -hmm. Narcan. That means also adding in the wide distribution of things like Fentanyl test strips, because many people, not everybody who uses drugs, right, is a quote unquote drug addict. Some are recreational drug users. I live in Las Vegas, Nevada, right? Uh, We've got the strip down here. And, you know, we have folks who overdose and die because they take what they think is cocaine or an Adderall or uh, uh, or Molly or something, and it has a lethal dose of fentanyl in it. So we need to encourage people if they are using drugs to test their drugs. And we have to get beyond this. Look, tough love is such an interesting concept, but we have to we have to have compassion with folks too, right? Sure. But, but drug use doesn't happen. Chaotic drug use doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's usually the, the result of some unresolved trauma. It's the result of poverty, right? It's the result of economic situations there. You know, we're a big union state here in Nevada, right? Sure. Um, one of the biggest, one of the, the biggest supporters of, of my campaign, but also this issue. And one of the reasons they're supporting me is look, Union workers, particularly the building trades, right? Yeah, good jobs, you know, uh, union benefits, healthcare, all those things are important. But what's really important right now is recovery because, you know, the number one industry that's being impacted by overdose deaths right now in the United States, the number one industry are the construction trades, right? And it's because the construction the trades for men and, and whatnot, or that's right. Well, injury, injury on the job, but also because of. Um, job insecurities, right? So there's periods of time when folks will be out of work while they're waiting for the next job, which creates economic stress and anxiety, which then leads folks to, you know, turn to things like alcohol and and drugs and opioids. Right. Um, right. So it, it, you know, you're, 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 you're something like 19 times more likely to die of an overdose than of a job related injury. If you're in the construction trades. So you're running right now for the state uh, state house, state assembly, and and you're in a red to blue kind of seat, and you've had a fairly, mm-hmm. you know, to put it mildly, a fairly ugly campaign from the Republicans. Talk to us a little bit about how you've encountered that that really toxic kind of campaigning that they're that they're doing, because they're actually trying to make the fact that you're in recovery into a campaign issue, which I find staggering given the number of Republicans I know who are in recovery. Yeah. Um, and thanks for, for bringing that up. You know, when I got into the race, um, it, it is an open seat and, um, I had lost some friends, uh, last summer and have long seen this nexus right between a lot of the issues that my neighbors and the folks up here in Northwest are dealing with and the sure. issues that we have dealt with in the recovery community. We all need access to good health care, right? And affordable health care. We all need access to good, high-paying jobs, right? We all need access to housing. I mean, these are social determinants of health. Like, those are the big three for you when you're someone who is trying to get into long-term sure. recovery. But it's also the big three for what my neighbors are dealing with. And so I've been a long believer of 
folks who are closest to the problem are also closest to the solution. And um, I, I may be you know naive for saying this, but when I got in, I thought this was going to be a really good opportunity to have these discussions on a very authentic, meaningful level sure. with with voters from all walks of life. And we started walking in January. And I could tell you some of the best conversations I've had at the doors have been with Republican voters. Because once I tell them who I am and what in my main agency around this, it has brought down those walls and they have shared their stories with me. And it has been heartwarming to me to think that maybe we can get to a place where we can cut through this toxic politics and be able to have shared values and shared stories that allows sure. us to work together. And you know, I, in my work, you know, just to preface your question on what the GOP is doing right now in my work over the past in 2018, Newt Gingrich, who I have worked with on this issue, who has been very forward thinking on medication for opioid use disorder. One of the Mm -hmm. best advocates we've had, I've served with him at advocates for opioid recovery. And he said, you know, Ryan Hampton has smart common sense solutions to consider. But once I got into this race and became, I guess, seemingly a threat to the other side, all that went away. And I can tell you the ads, the ads that I'm seeing right now are Ryan Hampton's dangerous drug agenda. Ryan Hampton wants to legalize fentanyl and dangerous drugs like fentanyl and cocaine. And nothing could be further from the truth because the GOP in their own polling can tell that my recovery and who I am is works. It works with Republicans, Democrats and independents because they're looking for something different. So what are they going to do? They're going to they are going to take us backwards. Right. And add into the stigma. And I believe the ads are running. Look, I'm brushing them off as as best I can. Right. But what they're doing is they are putting more people into the shadows who need help and creating more stigma, which kills people. And I can tell you, our governor, who has co-signed this crap you know, should be ashamed of himself because these are the same people who say we can't arrest our way out of a public health crisis. But guess what? When it's election time, we are going to do everything that we can to defeat good folks who are running for office and to destroy movements like the recovery movement. It is disgusting and folks should be ashamed of themselves. Yeah, I, I think it is a really, I mean, there, there, there are some red lines that I've tried to stay away from in campaigns over my lifetime. Um, you know, I've always, if, if the children of a candidate are not, if they're civilians, they're out. You never mention them. You never attack them. You never do that. People in recovery is another thing. I have several times in my in my political career had the chance to go after, you know, when I was a Republican and go after Democrats, go after them on the fact that they were in recovery or they had a, or they had a substance issue. Never did it. You know why? I Mm-hmm. I am still a human being at some level in these equations. And if they're abandoning that level of humanity and, and be willing to say, OK, we're going to burn down many, the, this guy so that we can we can intimidate anybody else who might ever cross us, um, even if it means you know that we're going to scare people off of recovery, I find it to be an egregious and really dangerous behavior. And I can tell you, they've got, I mean, these are paid grifters of like the worst kind on the other side that are, that are oh, doing sure. this right now. I mean, they've got folks on payroll at, at these dark money packs and political action sure. committees, you know, putting out, you know, churning out uh, fake news headlines saying, you know, meet the former heroin junkie seeking to turn red seat blue. And I can tell you, I actually, I have a sense of um, belief and hope that right. voters are smarter than that and actually don't buy into it because the more time, whenever I see those ads, you know what I do? I go out and I knock on doors. You know whose doors I go knock on? I go knock on independents, nonpartisans, and Republicans. Yep. And you know what? Yep. They, they, my story is their story. You know, they every one in three Americans are impacted by addiction. Sure. Like you, you could throw a stone. One of your neighbors is going to be impacted. And I just <laughs> don't. I just think this has been a risky strategy for the Republican party to do this, but more importantly than just tearing me down, 
these are not serious people who are talking about this. No. Like I no. am willing to have a conversation with governor, my governor Lombardo tomorrow and my opponent about how we come together for common sense solutions to solve a crisis that is killing Nevadans and killing Nevadans, uh, killing Nevadans and Americans. They are more interested in manufacturing lies and fear and trying to get voters all riled up uh, about who I am. And, and, and the information they're putting out about me is categorically false. You know, so it's like, I, I know who I am. I wake up in the morning and I'm, you know, I'm good with myself. Um, but you know, we got, I guess you could say miles to go until election day. So we'll, we'll, we'll we see sure how it do. plays and, out. But and, we do know, have to. Look, being authentic, doing the work, being out there, owning what, owning your past is a really important thing for any candidate. Um, everything you try to hide in politics is the thing that kills you. So you've owned the thing mm-hmm. that, that most people would hide. And that, I think, is a really commendable decision. I think the book is a is a great look, folks, into a crisis that we are still in the midst of. It is it is it is an evolving crisis. And and there's still a sense that people like the Sacklers have have avoided a lot of responsibility and culpability in this. And folks, if you don't know who the Sacklers are, just go Google the name Sackler and OxyContin and you will learn more than you will ever hope to learn about how uh People with billions of dollars can spend a lot on lawyers and get away with murder, pretty much. Um, it is a, it is it is a, a crisis that Ryan is an able and smart chronicler of in this book. I really recommend it. It's Fentanyl Nation. You should take a look at it. Um, it's available where all fine books are sold. Ryan, tell us where folks can reach you on social media and give us your campaign website so they can go there if they want to find out more. Absolutely. I'll give the campaign website first because that's the fight I'm in right now. Uh, campaign website is www.ryan4fornevada.com. Uh, you can learn more about me on my personal author site, uh, ryanhampton.com. Follow me on Twitter at Ryan for Recovery, um, on on Facebook um, at, at Addiction X America, and Instagram at Ryan J uh, Hampton. And thank you, Rick, for all you're doing. I got to tell you, um, my campaign manager um, and and a lot of the folks in my campaign are disaffected Republicans um, and also moderate Republicans who believe that we can't sure. cut through this toxic politics. You know, I think it's more important that we focus on individual values than what actually divides us. You know, that is, there are a lot more of us out there than people think who are, who are trying to get work done. And, and you, my friend are doing the work. I appreciate you writing this book. I appreciate your advocacy for folks in recovery. And I appreciate you running for office, putting yourself out there. It is always difficult. They're making it hard on you. But I think if you are able to triumph in this, you can, you can look at this as something that was a mission that will serve more people um, than, than you can imagine. So with that, Ryan Hampton, thank you so much for coming on the Lincoln Project podcast today. We look forward to talking to you again soon and best of luck this fall. Thank you, Rick. And good luck.